One word can bring terror into a person's heart, cancer. When you think of all the different cancers, lung cancer, prostate, pancreatic, colorectal, brain, breast, you think, whoa, with a war on cancer of over 40 years, hundreds of billions of dollars spent, shouldn't we have a better cure rate? Well, we don't. Why? Why have we not done better in the war on cancer? Should we even have a war on cancer? I believe that we should have a different approach. I'm Gary Knoll. Join me now in this special documentary on cancer and see what the real causes and more importantly, the real natural and non-toxic approaches to prevention and treatment are. Cancer is uncontrolled cells that are constantly reproducing, proliferating. Um, they're unchecked by the body's def uh, internal defenses. They invade other organs. They develop their own blood supply. And they cause a severe um, immunological dysfunction. In cancer, one develops a primary tumor where cells become undifferentiated, very primitive, so to speak, and they are constantly replicating, proliferating. In addition, they develop a new and their own blood supply, which facilitates an invasion into d uh, frequently distant organ sites. And this is what we call metastases. Metastases could be very dangerous because they could invade vital organs. They can also dis further disrupt the immune system and increase the tumor burden on an already compromised body, which can obviously cause significant morbidity and mortality. Cancer is a multifactorial, multiply caused phenomenon that has plagued our population for many, many years. The unfortunate occurrence of cancer and types of cancers have risen over so many years. Traditional medicine is always looking at a medication to change the symptom or to change the progression of that bad cluster of cells, but rarely ever looks for the underlying cause of illness. There are thousands of studies that look at the underlying causes of cancer. The causes of cancer are multifactorial. Of course, we do not know all the causes, and in each person, the causes could be very, could be very different. If we understand cancer and its causes in terms of this web of causation that I, that I, that I speak about, we'll not, we will not search for the one cause and try to tag on to one cause uh, to one factor as the cause of cancer. Numerous chemicals that are in our environment that we use and interact with on a daily basis have been identified as carcinogens. Thyroid cancer is skyrocketing in America. That is a surefire sign that we are exposed to more environmental toxicity today than ever before because the thyroid really is a very sensitive barometer, as we know, to environmental toxicity. And I think this should be a, a wake-up call that we really need to take, it, take into account seriously, not just diet and smoking in terms of causes of cancer, but also other forms of environmental toxicity. We know that cigarette smoking causes cancer. There are 4,000 chemicals in cigarette smoke, including arsenic, cadmium, formaldehyde, these are some of the cancer-causing agents in the cigarette. You should never use styrofoam, uh, and if you use styrofoam, if you put tea or coffee in it, there are studies showing that the acidity in the tea or coffee draws out the chemicals that are in styrofoam that are carcinogenic. And when you use a microwave, you, you amplify the leaching of these carcinogens into the water. Hair dyes have been definitely proven to cause cancers. 
and of course spraying insecticides. I, 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 I shiver when, when patients tell me I had my whole house insecticided. They, they spray around the floors and they have young children that play around the floor. Environmental causes of cancer are many, such as benzene, arsenic, Heavy metals have been known to cause cancers such as nickel, lead, and other types of heavy metals. Cadmium is linked with breast, prostate, and pancreatic cancer, and a great deal of research talks about this. But unless we change our approach to the cancer patient, we're not going to see significant improvement. If heavy metals are there contributing to the damage and causing cancer, and causing free radical destruction, and weakening the immune response, you can give all the chemo and all the other therapies you like, Unless you change the underlying causes, you're not going to see improvement. We should prepare our home, use HEPA filters to trap allergens and chemicals that may exist in the home, test the water. You don't want to work in an office that's in a sick building. You won't want to be around people that smoke. And you certainly want to test for vitamins, minerals, hormones, and heavy metals because the heavy metals are a significant risk for cancer. To many of the orthodox researchers, will say that you can't really say that a single exposure to some toxic chemical will lead to any type of cancer situation, but we take in 30,000 chemicals a year that are synthetic, and the combination, even in very small doses, can be deadly, and no one can possibly figure out what the synergistic effect of taking in thousands of uh, chemicals, synthetic chemicals, into our body is in terms of cancer progression. And the only reason why we're still exposed to them, why they haven't been taken off the market, because people are still under this naive belief that if we're exposed to them in such low concentrations, it's not going to hurt us. But what they're failing to understand is that they're hurting us over time, and when they're combined with a myriad of many other toxins, uh, known carcinogens, there is a significant synergistic effect. Perhaps these chemicals are not going to kill us instantly like they kill little insects, but instead they're going to cause our demise over an extended period of time. We now know a lot of the chemicals in the environment, for example, are estrogenic, which in a woman can be a disaster because estrogen, we now know, stimulates breast cancer to grow. Many breast cancers, in fact, cannot grow in the absence of estrogen, they actually require estrogen for their growth and for their own well-being, if you can think of a tumor in terms of its own well-being. We know that having too much red meat is a risk for colon cancer and possibly breast or prostate cancer because of all the chemicals, because of the hormone, animal hormone influence. The food preservatives, especially in meats, the nitrosamines and so forth, cause cancers. Artificial sweeteners are molecularly uh, altered sugar and yes, it tastes like sugar, but the alteration in the molecule is a foreign substance in the body and can cause havoc, such as cancers as proven. Radiation clearly relates to cancer. We know after the toxic catastrophe in Chernobyl uh, that there was an increased incidence in the number of cancers. We saw it in their necks. We know that excess sunlight may cause certain people to have skin cancers, those individuals that have lighter skin and less pigment in their skin. We know that vitamin and mineral deficiency is linked with increased risk of cancers. Other causes uh, of cancer are genetics. Now there are definite genes that could cause cancers, and this is well documented, such as Burkitt's lymphoma, uh, Hodgkin's disease, and uh, even lung cancer has been linked to genetics. However, there is a theory and a fact, actually, not just a theory, that there are several patients that have genes that could possibly cause cancers, but yet they do not get them. For instance, a new-ish gene, if you will, called the BRCA gene, the breast cancer gene, is a BRCA1 and 2 gene. Several patients have the gene but never get cancer. The reason is if their lifestyle is a very healthy one, it might not trigger the cancer gene to take over and promote itself. The environment washes over the genes to produce a final outcome. And depending on the environment, um, that will determine how the genes express themselves. Many people are under the impression that the genome, the genes are just this one long strand that's um, 
uh, encoded one gene after the other and uh, in a very linear way and it's just going to r read itself and it's going to produce either a healthy outcome or a deadly outcome. We, we know that's not true, that the genes express themselves in clusters and these clusters can change um, depending on the environment, depending on the mind and the environment that's speaking to it. We know, for example, flaxseed and fish oil uh, uh, actually speak to the genes and turn certain genes on and certain genes off. Numerous phytonutrients that are found in the natural world that we bring into our bodies um, it, uh, cause the cells to display uh, different types of metabolism and it can change the whole uh, uh, expression. It, it's, it's the software that the, that the cells use to express themselves, and that is this internal environment. And again, this internal environment is composed of the foods that we're eating. If you're eating French fries and cola and meat that um, is full of toxins and pesticides and comes from animals that have been fed all kinds of unhealthy food, well, that's going to turn our genes on in a certain way, as opposed to eating healthy foods full of phytonutrients that are found in the natural world. Well, they'll turn on a whole different set of genes, which will re result in a whole different expression. Well, we spend $3.7 trillion a year on cancer, and yet we get very poor results. Uh, there's really no relationship between the amount of money that we spend and the results we're getting. Improvements in the use of chemotherapy over the last 20 or so years um, are so small for the amount of money, the, the trillions of dollars that have been poured into conventional cancer research. It is, and it, for what's got been gotten back for that, with the relentless focus and the, and the narrow focus on chemotherapeutics radiation, is really um, uh, pathetic, frankly. And I think the major reason for this is that we are going completely in the wrong direction in terms of uh, treating cancer. Uh, the focus in conventional medicine for treating cancer is to destroy all cancer cells uh, at all costs. The major modalities that are used are surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and sometimes anti-hormonal balancing. Uh, and this focus on killing cancer cells does not put any emphasis on the health of the person. There is so much emphasis placed on shrinking tumors. That's how they determine whether a treatment is working or not. So for example, if you have a lung cancer and you get certain chemotherapy and they do a CAT scan before and a CAT scan three months later and the tumor is shrinking, they say, oh, wow, we're getting some positive effect. Let's continue with the treatment. Or if it's not shrinking, they may say, well, we're not going to, we have to switch treatments. But the fact is when you look at the relationship between the size of a tumor and survival, there's virtually no relationship. In other words, a person may have a shrinkage of tumor, but not improve the survival at all. So you can have a shrinkage of the tumor on CAT scan, but three months later, the patient is dead from metastases all over the body. The metastases go to the brain, go to the liver, and so on, and then the patient just has no chance anymore. So in many cases, we now try, instead of trying to get rid of every cancer cell, we try to see if we can treat cancer more as a chronic degenerative disease get the person as healthy as possible, and perhaps they can live much longer and maybe even a normal lifespan with the cancer in their body without focusing so much on killing every cancer cell, but instead focusing on the body's defenses and keeping the cancer under control, keeping it from growing, keep it, keeping it from invading, keeping it from metastasizing to other areas of the body, because it's that process of invasion and metastases to vital organs that really kills the patient, usually then more than than the, the individual primary cancer in the first place. One of the tragic aspects of this blinkered view of what should be done with cancer, the kind of treatments that should be used, uh, is r so apparent when it comes particularly to chemotherapy because 
what we see is the fact that chemotherapy can work very well for a certain number of cancers. If you're talking about testicular cancer, childhood leukemias, certain lymphomas, there, there are a number of good examples where chemotherapy can cure people. But for the vast majority of the most common cancers, which include lung cancer, um, advanced metastatic breast cancer, um, you know, colorectal cancer and prostate cancer, um, there, and, and many other GI cancers as well as gynecologic, including ovarian. There is some benefit in early stage disease using some the conventional treatments of surgery and, and chemotherapy. But once a disease becomes advanced, uh, chemotherapy and radiation, but particularly chemotherapy, has proven to be wholly inadequate, and it really makes very little difference in extending lives. There are very few cancers that respond to chemo and radiation. The cancers that are caught earliest and are removed by surgery have the greatest chance of survival, and that's been known for many years. And the statistics about cancer survival, even with chemo or radiation, are a little bit misleading because they talk about three-year survival rates. Many patients will survive three years without any technique or any therapy for cancers. I have a patient in my practice now who's well into her 80s. She's had a breast cancer for maybe 10 or 15 years. She's never done anything. The cancer's still there, but she's still alive. I think to some extent, the chemo and radiation damage the body so much that people become more ill and they can die from the side effects of chemo or radiation or a weak immune response and the cancers progress because of the damage that's incurred on the body by those techniques. There are four major negative factors that are associated with both radiation and chemotherapy. The first is that they're both carcinogenic. That is, they cause cancer. So you have these, treat these treatments which are supposed to cure something or, or help something actually causes the very thing it's supposed to help or cure. So they're, they're carcinogenic or cancer producing. Chemotherapy itself can cause cancers. In fact, we, if we take breast cancer protocols that have what we call alkylating agents, which is cytoxin, metrixate, and many other drugs, they can actually cause leukemias in the future. Radiation that's used for cancer can also incite uh, cancer itself, such as breast cancer. So chemotherapy in itself you might win one battle but create another war. The second thing is that they are mutagenic, which means they cause mutations and that's part of the mechanisms by which they bring about the development of cancer. So both radiation and chemotherapy are mutagenic. They cause mutations. Uh, the third issue is they are immune suppressive. So the body has various defenses that it uses to try to get on top of cancer. We have built-in mechanisms to try to control the disease, prevent the disease, and here you have treatments that impair the very systems that are necessary in the body to have long-term control of the cancer. And the fourth factor is they have unbelievable side effects in many cases. I mean, we know that chemotherapy will essentially kill uh, any fast-growing cells in the body. It doesn't discriminate and pick out cancer cells and selectively attack them. That's the worst aspect of chemotherapy. Um, it's going to kill any cell that's fast-growing in the body. So the GI tract, where the lining of the GI tract are, involves very fast-growing endothelial cells, is going to take a huge hit and in, in was resulting in the major GI side effects as well as, you know, the, the nausea and vomiting that we associate with chemotherapy. And then, of course, there are many drugs that patients have to take to subdue the nausea and vomiting, which involves that much more cost to the system. And if some of those drugs have side effects. They lower white blood counts in many cases. They lower platelets. So white blood cells are a part of the immune system. Platelets are needed for blood clotting. And if you lower platelets too much, you can have bleeding episodes. And people sometimes die from bleeding out due to drops in platelets. You get severe infections due to the, the drop in white blood count. You see some of the deaths associated with cancer treatment involve uh, out-of-control infections resulting from the suppression of the immune system 
by chemotherapy. You get nausea, you get vomiting, you have loss of appetite, you get weight loss, you, you get not only from the cancer do you get cachexia or wasting of the body, but from the radiation and chemotherapy you can get those kinds of treatments. Patients often tell me that the worst thing that they experience is fatigue, and it's not addressed adequately by the system. I mean, if you're going to give people these drugs because you claim you have nothing else to offer, there has to be a fix for the side effects. And there could be, and there should be, and there isn't. I think what we need to do when it comes to cancer therapy is be very selective. And by, by selective, I mean we want to focus on inhibiting or killing cancer cells and at the same time not harm normal cells. And in fact, if we can, even promote normal cells and, and encourage their health. So this is what we try to do in our practice. We try to select as much as possible uh, agents that will be very selective and will be helpful to the cancer patient to help them control their illness. What I tell patients when they are trying to make a decision as to whether what kind of conventional treatment they should do, if any, I say they have to ask basic focus on three main questions. The first question is, what is my survival value? If I take this treatment, am I more likely, am I likely to live uh, s several months longer, several years longer, several days longer, uh, uh, or at all? Am I going to improve my survival chances by taking this treatment as compared to doing nothing? The second question is, what is my quality of life going to be? Am I going to be healthier and happier and feeling better, or am I going to feel worse? And as we know, the severe side effects from radiation and chemotherapy often will have people feeling worse. If there's no improvement in survival value and you're just going to feel worse from quality of life, what's the point of doing the treatment? As I see it, the main treatment is that it's cultural, it's, it's financial, the standard of care, this is, how, this is how we do it. We don't pay any attention to making people healthy. We pay attention to killing tumors by using these very harsh treatments. I, I think the primary reason is the profit motive where there is a tremendous vested interest in sustaining a system. There's a tragically uh, low, minimal commitment to cancer prevention. And, and a shift uh, to a, a greater emphasis on prevention would benefit the entire world. We talk about the beneficial foods, organic vegetables, broccoli with uh, indocarbinol, sulforaphane, any of the green leafy vegetables. Soy has genistein, dad is in it. When we look at garlic, it's a great immune stimulant. When we look at vitamin C, it can help to quadruple killer cells. So there are a variety of good things to have in the diet. How do you prevent disease and cancer? A healthy lifestyle, and I call it the pillars of health. Leafy green vegetables, organic if possible, fruit as well. Trying to lean towards vegetarianism. It is a medical fact that vegetarians have less cancer and less heart disease. <music>